Hello and welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. I'm Tom. And I'm Simon. And this week we're moving off the land and onto the oceans for the formation of sea ice. And I'm going to be talking about some of the remarkable physics of water ice and the fact that it's kind of key for us even being here and there being life on Earth. Absolutely. Let's hope you can bear with us. What is sea ice and how is it different to land ice or freshwater ice? Sea ice occupies about 7% of the world's oceans and is very important for the global energy budget due to its consistently high albedo. Albedo is an important concept and it is simply the proportion of light or radiation that is reflected from a surface. So if it's perfectly white and reflecting everything, it's one. If it's perfectly black and absorbing everything, it's zero. In order for sea ice to form, the water must be cooled on its upper surface to the point where it will freeze solid. Cooling of the ocean surface by the atmosphere would always make that surface water more dense, causing it to sink and therefore set up convection cells, bringing warmer and less dense water to the surface. This will continue to happen down to the freezing point. In seawater, due to the addition of salt, that freezing point is about minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. Just as a heads up, convection is the tendency of cooler and therefore more dense materials to sink and warmer and therefore less dense materials to rise under the influence of gravity. It may seem then, that we have to cool the entire water column to minus 1.8 before we see any freezing on the surface. However, actually the Arctic Ocean and the Antarctic Oceans as well are stratified into different layers caused by salinity and temperature differences. And therefore we only need to cool the top 100 to 150 meters of water, which is a lot less than the total amount. However, this is still quite a large body of water. This is one of the reasons why you see sea ice forming a little bit later in the winter season than you would do on a freshwater lake or a smaller body of water in a similar climatic condition. We'll be returning to Tom later to talk about the formation of sea ice in detail, but for now, I'm going to abuse my power as the editor of this series because I want to talk to you about some of the cool physics of ice. The fact that ice is less dense than water is actually one of the most remarkable properties about it. As we can see in this model, this is a model of the molecular structure of ice. At each vertex, we have a water molecule, red being an oxygen atom and white being a hydrogen atom, so we have H2O. And between them, we have these metal bars. Now, these aren't just here to keep the thing together. These represent hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So there are lots of ways in which molecules can talk to each other. Hydrogen bonds are just one way in which they can do that. And the effect of the hydrogen bonds is to form a crystalline structure. A crystallized structure has a regular repeated structure of a definite chemical composition, which actually means that ice is a mineral. Because the molecules of water aren't just mushed together by other forms of bonding, they actually have space between them. It means that when the water transitions from a liquid to a solid state, the mean distance between the molecules actually increases. And this means that the density of ice is less than water because the same amount of water in liquid form expands to a greater volume when it becomes a solid, but the mass has stayed the same, so the density has gone down. So not only does this explain why ice floats on water, it's actually key to why life exists on Earth. Were we based on another liquid that didn't have a solid form that was less dense than its liquid form, if the top layer of this liquid at the, exposed to the atmosphere were to freeze, it would then sink and expose new liquid to the atmosphere, which would then freeze and sink. And you'd get the entire world's oceans, all the bodies of water, being frozen solid. The fact that ice forms a less dense layer than the water underneath protects it, seals it in from the effect of a cold atmosphere. This model is actually a memorial to a PhD student here at Spry, Jeremy Bailey, who died in 1965 when he was on an expedition in Antarctica and his vehicle plunged into a crevasse, killing him and the other two researchers on board. Science can be difficult, and perhaps no more difficult than the science of the cryosphere, where our knowledge has been hard won, sometimes with the loss of life. So, the formation of sea ice is an important process, and as always, there's more to it than meets the eye at first. Sea ice actually forms differently in calm water as opposed to rough water. In quiet conditions, the first ice to form is a skim of tiny two to three millimeter disc-shaped individual crystals. Each disc has its sea axis vertical, that is to say its shortest axis vertical, and continues to grow outwards laterally. At a certain point, this shape becomes unstable and the crystal starts to grow out in long dendritic arms, following a kind of hexagonal structure that's very typical, as we've seen, to water. 
these outgrowing arms are very fragile and very quickly break off, even in this calm water, which leaves this kind of mush of discs and arms all floating around together on the surface of the water. In quiet conditions, these crystals soon start to freeze together and form a very thin layer of new young ice. This is called Nilas ice. With any kind of turbulence in the water, either from the wind or maybe tidal action, these fragments get broken up further and the density of these fragments in the water increases until you reach a point at which you have grease ice or frasal ice. Once this Nilas ice has formed, you start to get a very different process of accumulation where water from the sea freezes onto the bottom of the ice. This happens until the ice is about 1, 1.5 metres thick, at which point you have your young, new ice. When only a few centimetres thick, this new young ice is pretty transparent. As it grows and grows, however, it turns grey and then finally white. The reason why you stop getting the freeze-on of ice below 1, 1.5 metres thickness is that the cold of the atmosphere can no longer penetrate the ice far enough in order to cool the water enough to freeze it on. Remember that the ocean water is relatively warm compared to the atmosphere, and once it's insulated by this layer of ice, you're no longer generating enough cooling in order to create freezing. In rough water, these small phrasal particles cannot easily bind together, and therefore they increase in density until the point at which they start to form cakes. As these cakes move around and are sloshed around in the phrasal ice mixture, more and more phrasal ice is frozen on as the ice crystals bind together. This becomes known as pancake ice, because collisions between the cakes push phrasal ice that's suspended in the water up onto the ice, which then drains away, leaving phrasal ice frozen onto the surrounding edge of the cake, which ends up looking a lot like a pancake. At the ice edge, these pancakes are only a few centimetres in diameter, but the further and further into the ice pack you move, the pancakes become much larger, sometimes between three to five metres. The surrounding phrasal ice continues to supply material to these pancakes. Further into the ice pack, where the wave field is calmed, these pancakes start to coalesce together and form consolidated pancake ice. This consolidated pancake ice is your first year ice. Such ice has a very different bottom morphology to the icy ice formed in calmer water. Because these flows are crashing into each other and then being frozen together like glue with the Nilas ice, you get a very rough bottom surface and then a top surface that has cleft planes and all sorts of things going on at the top that looks a lot like a stony field it's often compared to. This is very different to the smooth, perhaps more traditional, cartoon-looking sea ice formed in calm water. If any of this newly formed ice survives the summer melt season and is not ejected by currents down to lower latitudes, they will continue to steadily grow until it reaches a depth of about three metres. Just three, at this three metre depth, the summer melt and winter accumulation is in about equilibrium. Interestingly, the older the ice is, the less saline it is, and therefore the more resistant to melt it is. This sets up a positive feedback in terms of melting, whereby if you have a very hot summer and you melt a lot of the old ice, the new ice that then forms that winter is much weaker and therefore much easier to melt the following summer. This is one reason why warm summers in the Arctic are such a problem for sea ice extent. During its lifetime, sea ice is pushed and pulled around a lot by the wind, and the wind is a critical factor in a lot of sea ice processes. And unfortunately, at this point, we now have to go to Simon to do things properly. Ah, but Tom, how does something like the wind move something huge and flat like sea ice? Well, to answer that, as in most things in life, we have maths. Wind pushes sea ice around by a process called frictional drag. Now, in order to understand this, we're first going to look at an idealised model. So what we have here is a mass, can be anything, on a plane, just a flat surface. And let's say we want to move this mass around. So we would loop a rope around it and we'd give it a tug. Now what determines how effective the force exerted in that rope is in, in pushing that mass around is what's called the coefficient of friction between the mass and the plane. Hopefully this will all sound familiar to you if you've done A-level maths. The larger the coefficient of friction between two surfaces, the rougher the boundary is, and so the greater the force required to pull or push the object horizontally across the surface. But in the case of wind pushing sea ice around, we don't have the wind lassoing the ice and pulling it on a rope. Instead, we just have air masses blowing away on the top of the ice. Now, these actually produce a frictional drag by what's called a boundary condition. So the fact that the velocity of the air up here is quite large, but the fact that the velocity of the air within the ice, and actually a layer just ever so slightly above the ice, is zero. This produces what's called a vertical wind shear. And when we plug this boundary condition, the velocity being zero at the surface boundary condition into our equations, we find that there's a frictional drag exerted by the wind on the ice. 
Now, the coefficient of friction between the air and the ice may not be huge, it's actually quite small, but so is the force that's exerted by the wind via the frictional drag. Now, if we were trying to push ice uh, on land, nothing would happen. But we're not on land. We're talking about sea ice. So underneath our ice, there isn't land, there's sea. If we were trying to push ice over land, then the coefficient of friction between the ice and the land is so large that a small force exerted by wind stress just wouldn't be enough to push the ice. However, on the sea, the coefficient of friction between the water and the ice is low enough that even a small force exerted by frictional drag, especially if you consider it over a large enough area, is more than enough to push our ice and see significant movement. The key fact here then is the boundary condition between the air moving over the ice and the air being stationary in the ice, and the fact that we have two interfaces, one of which is between the ice and the water, which has a very low coefficient of friction. The wind stress that drives the sea ice through frictional drag can be gathered from very large areas, up to 400 kilometers upwind. Since ice has little strength under tension, cracks can open up in the flows. These cracks are called leads and will rapidly refreeze during winter. This is due to the big temperature difference between the water, which is at about minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, and the atmosphere, which could be at around minus 36 degrees Celsius or even less. The heat loss from a newly opened lead can be so violent, something in the region of 1,000 watts per meter squared, that it's as though steam is exploding from the surface. This steam is actually frozen water vapor, as the surface water comes into contact and evaporates very quickly with the very cold air. This newly opened lead freezes very rapidly, and when the wind fields become convergent again, this is the first part of the flow to be crushed. In this way, we start to form what's known as pressure ridges, which have huge sails going up into the air a couple of meters, and it's been even known that the keel of the pressure ridge can go down to about 50 meters below the ice. These ridges in the Arctic can actually make up quite a large amount of the ice mass. Some estimates have it around 40 to 60% of the ice mass of the Arctic ice is actually contained in these big pressure ridges that have been formed between as the flows crash together. Because of these leads and ridges, the landscape of the Arctic Ocean is not just a plain white sheet, but it's an ever-changing system of walls and valleys and rough patches and smooth patches that constantly changes. This is one of the big challenges for the early explorers of the Arctic, was navigating this chaotic landscape. This whole array of formation, melting, opening and closing passes through a whole selection of cyclical processes, largely based on the seasonal melt season. With our changing climate, it's in looking increasingly likely that we're going to lose the vast majority of our Arctic ice cover, and a significant amount of sea ice cover in the Antarctic as well. Sea ice isn't the only thing in this series that was made on water, because in front of us we have well, it, it looks a bit like a boring wooden box, if I'm honest. <laughs> ah, well, it might look boring, but it's quite an interesting wooden box, really. And it contains lots of lovely geological specimens. Yes, I mean, as, as I said earlier, it looks a bit like a sweet box, but you wouldn't really want to eat anything in it. Uh, not if you want to keep all your teeth intact, no. Uh, although the folks who collected this might have wanted anything to eat. <laughs> uh, so this was from the Aurora expedition, which was from 1911 to 1914. You might have heard of Shackleton. So he had this great plan to go uh, send one ship to one side of Antarctica and another ship to the other side, and then... He would walk across, meanwhile the other people would lay depots so he had food to meet up with. Um, sadly, it all went a bit wrong and Shackleton's ship got crushed on the ice and he managed to get all of his folks back in one piece. Meanwhile, the Aurora crew were left expecting Shackleton to turn up and laying their depots and doing a bit of science. So that's where this box comes from. But actually there's quite a long history of collecting geological specimens in polar regions. So we've got things that go back certainly to the 19th century. And it was just part of your exploration. You would go out, you would map a new bit of coastline, you'd collect some zoological specimens, you'd collect some geological specimens. And now a lot of this material sits in museum collections. Perhaps not doing an awful lot, but it's still here for research. So we've been accumulating this kind of layers and layers of scientific evidence. And it really is the evidence that we use for learning about the world. So, I mean, this is what the days when the, the cryosphere was such a new thing. Mm -hmm. Every expedition you, you were required to pick fruit from every possible tree. And this is just sort of the geological picking. So yeah. these, these are all different rocks. Absolutely, minerals. yeah. Uh, and yeah, so you're absolutely right. They would go and do a little bit of everything. And certainly in the 19th century, it was all about the gentleman scientist who had this very broad, wide ranging education and would be expected to be able to draw quite well so he could capture his information like that, know which rock specimens to collect and how to label them up. Uh, so yeah, it's, it really also, harks back also, to that. going back to the box, make a box. <laughs> I think they had quite a lot of time on their hands. Yeah, but so this, this was made on the Aurora. Yeah, I don't know where the wood came from. It might have been a box that they took with them. Um, 
But yeah, it's from, it dates from that expedition, so it's possible they took the box with them or they did have carpenters on board. So with plenty to do. With, well, with not enough to do, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So talking about the gentleman scientist, one of the fields which I haven't talked about in this series at all is oceanography, so the study of how the ocean moves and mm -hmm. what is. Um, and there's a link to the ocean oceanographic sciences here as well. Yeah, so they'd collect their rocks, they'd collect their animals, they'd collect any flora they found. They also did daily measurements of temperature, both of the water and of the air, salinity levels, so how much salt there was. And in the 19th century, they did recordings that they collected all of this information that later led to our understanding of the Gulf Stream, for instance. So yeah, it all adds up to help us build our theories. And it's knowledge which we're still very much applying now. Yeah, and we've got people here in the Institute who've done research where they've gone back to historical records in order to compare them with what we have today. So a lot of the climate science that we have uses this 19th century stuff as a kind of benchmark so you can see what the trends are and how things have shifted. Was this the earliest point in history where people were taking that rigorous measurements like that? Mm. Certainly the earliest point where there were a lot of people doing it. So mid-19th century, sadly, we lost Franklin and his crew. There were two ships that were lost. And as a result of that, lots of people went looking for them. And pretty much everyone that went looking for them did some recording of data. So there were something like 200 trips to the Arctic in the 19th century, and over half of them published novel scientific results. In this oceanic-focused episode, we've covered the formation of sea ice and how it differs in rough and calm conditions, the fact that ice is less dense than liquid water and that this is key to life existing on Earth, that sea ice is mobilised by the wind through a vertical wind shear and the boundary condition that the air is not moving in the ice, combined with the low coefficient of friction between sea ice and the ocean underneath. And lastly, that the Arctic landscape isn't boring. It's a fascinating, ever-changing sea ice landscape with lots of different features. Well, we barely made it through that one, didn't we? We hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you've learned a few things about the cryosphere. But if you'd like to learn more, there's always more to learn, and some of it is down in the description. There's lots of links to further reading. And if you have a particular question about what we've talked about in this episode, then Tom and I will be in the comments section answering your questions for two hours after this video is uploaded. Thank you for watching, but also thank you to all of these people who helped make this series possible. It really wouldn't exist without them. In particular, the Recover Project at the University of Exeter and the Scott Polar Research Institute here in Cambridge. Thank you so much for helping us make this series. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>